of what we're going to do there. Okay, so I can start. Thank you very much for, first of all, the opportunity to give a presentation to do today at your conference. Even though it is just a virtual one, we try to do our very best to overcome Corona. And uh, the title of my presentation is shown here. Can you see my mouse as well? Can you see it? Can you see the mouse or can you not see the mouse? Yes, it's visible, of course. Okay, good. So what I would like to uh, talk about is um, an exciting title, The Wonderful Possibility of Micropolar Theory for Modeling Materials and Physical Phenomena. And um, the reason why I'm able to talk about micropolar theory at all is because of my co-author here, Jelena Wyszewskaya. Several years ago, she introduced me to this interesting topic, and ever since I have been working on it. So, um, just the second here. Um, dum, 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 dum. Ah. Um, so here's a brief outline of what I would like to present in what follows. First of all, I imagine that some of you have never heard of micropolar theory. So it is just fair if I introduce you to micropolar theory and tell you what this is. Uh, so we will see some equations here in the first uh, point uh, A. And then this will be followed by four examples of materials modeling. I have to say this, all of these examples are not my own work. I'm reporting on work other people did. So the first example is, has to do with soil mechanics, has to do with milling grains, and it is entitled uh, by the title, The Narrowing Crusher. What it is exactly, we shall see in a second. The second example is an homage to Professor Gielin. I will talk about Gielin's V tensor, or why circular motion could be possible without force. So this looks like a contradiction to Newton's um, uh, uh, laws. And then the third example I have in mind with micropolar theory is structural transformations during electric polarization. So we are moving away now from the mechanical world into the world of electromagnetism. And this is actually followed by the fourth example. It is also from the electromagnetic world and it has to do with the ether, a very mythological material it has to do, this fourth item has to do with the attempt to understand Maxwell's, Maxwell's equations mechanically. So here we will talk about the ether as a carrier material of electromagnetic waves. And in the end, I would like to draw some conclusions and give an outlook into the future. First of all, what is micropolar theory? I would like to start with a motivation with two citations from famous gentlemen the first one is Ehringen, the second one is a disciple of Ehringen, Beaujean. And uh, let us see what they have written here, what the attempt is, what they try to do with these extended theories, in particular with micropolar theory. So the question Ehringen posed was the following one. Is it possible to construct continuum theories, the emphasis is on continuum, that can predict something discrete? namely physical phenomena on the atomic, molecular, or on the nanoscale. Um, the second citation I would like to uh, present to you in this context is this one here by Mojin, and it aims in the same direction. It tries to show that these two worlds, world of continuum mechanics and the world of, uh, world of discrete mechanics, that they can be joined. And actually what he says here is the following. There are hardline continuum theoreticians. They do not believe that it is possible to form a relationship between these two worlds, but any true physicist, uh, in, in particular, personally, Mojan believe that the relationship that can be established with a sub-level degree of physical description, that this is an asset that no true physicist should discard. So this brings us to generalized continuum theories, which go beyond what is normally done in continuum mechanics. And um, this is outlined here. So we have now materials which carry additional internal degrees of freedom. And these materials, they need what is termed and called generalized continuum theories. And one such example are the so-called micropolar theories, which is the topic of my presentation. 
And these micropolar theories, they emphasize the rotational degrees of freedom a continuum point can have. And for that purpose, we are going to consider a very general bilinear form for the kinetic energy, and this is important, of a continuum point. Because this expression, which you see here, this is very, looks very familiar if you are used to study rigid body dynamics. So what we see here is, first of all, a, um, a, 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 the, the traditional uh, kinetic energy then we see here the traditional rotational energy with the inertia tensor J. And in between, we have a coupling term called with a B tensor, which connects the translational velocity and the angular velocity. You know that in traditional rigid body dynamics, this B, if you go to the, to the center of mass, this will drop out and you have just this and this. But for our continuum, and this is the proposition by Gillen, we're going to assume that this holds true. And as a matter of fact, if you look here, this looks kind of funny. Why do we have here the I, the unit tensor? Can we not just write one half V squared? And by the way, this kinetic energy, this is the specific kinetic energy. This is per unit mass. So this is why no mass is appearing here. So coming back to this I, can we not just completely discard it? Um, obviously, isotropy is here to hold. Well, yes and no. You know that in relativistic mechanics, we have a transversal mass and a longitudinal mass. So there is also ample room for, 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 for modif modifying this first term. But I'm not going to do this today. This is my kinetic energy impression upon which I will build my wonderful world of micropolar theories. And we introduce two things here. First of all, linear momentum and second, dynamic spin. And to do so, the linear momentum, we take this expression for the kinetic energy of the continuum point and we differentiate with respect to the translational velocity and we end up with this. So you see that the momentum, the linear momentum is already something which is uh, not, you, you may not be familiar from traditional continuum mechanics. In traditional mecha uh, continuum mechanics, the momentum is just a specific momentum, it's just the translational velocity. Here it is connected with the angular velocity and a coupling tensor B. And the dynamic spin, that's also a new quantity, consists of two expressions. This one is well known from rigid body dynamics, the moment of inertia and the angular velocity. By the way, the angular velocity is a new independent field. This is not the rotor of V. This is not the velocity, uh, the vorticity. It's a separate independent field. If you want to know more about that, you can take a look at uh, one of these wonderful books written by Gillen. Uh, unfortunately, up until today, only available in Russian, but it is possible to read that. So if you put in some energy, you can understand what Gillen means. I will take a few, the liberty to show you a few of his ideas. Um, now, micropolar theory, what is it all about? Um, we are looking for six fields. Uh, traditionally, we look for the mass balance, and we have the mass balance equation in its traditional form. Then we look for the velocity field, translational velocity, and for that we have the momentum balance, which is written here. It looks already a little slightly different. The divergence of the stress tensor is here, body forces, then there is this generalized um, momentum, which has an additional term. Here's a production term, which I'm going to explain in a second. Uh, the production term, which we see here, has to do with the fact that the microinertia and also this B tensor, that they have separate inertia tensor balances, which are written down here. And these are actually generalizations, which for the first time were presented in a paper by Ivanova and Bolshevskaya which is written here, and it allows for the possibility of internal structural transformations in these materials. I'm going to give you some examples. The crusher is one of the examples where this particular field, this production, is going to have some importance. And the other production is appearing here in the momentum balance. Now, the omega field, the angular velocity, that is um, governed by the spin balance, the spin balance is the add-on to the balance of moment of momentum, which forms total angular momentum. And this is written here. 
So we have here the coupled stress tensor, the divergence of it. Here the anti-symmetric parts of the stress tensor. Here we have some volume couples, which are the analogy to the, the, to the body forces, which we have in the momentum balance. And we have lots of production terms, also because of these productions here, which appear here in this parenthesis. But finally, we would like to know about temperature, and temperature stems from the internal energy balance. And here's the internal energy balance, internal energy production term due to the stress tensor, which is, can be anti-symmetric, and due to the coupled stress tensor, heat flux is here, and radiation is there. So these are our six fields, and of course, these are not enough because we have all these constitutive uh, relations here, or quantities here. Stress tensor is just one of them, and there are many others. So if we wish to establish and solve boundary value problems, we have to prescribe certain constitutive equations. I'm going to talk about some of these. By the way, here are some citations where you can find more information on that in case you're interested. It goes back also to the work of Gilin in another book by him, Rational Continuum Mechanics. And I mentioned this paper already. There's an alternative book by Yeremeyev and co-authors where you can find out about the foundations of micropolar mechanics. And most recently, we also produced another pamphlet where these equations are recapitulated. So, four examples are going to come now in order to illustrate this set of differential equations. And the first example is an engineering ex example, and I called it the narrowing crusher. Here's the narrowing crusher, and again, I would like to point out, it's not my own work, it's the master thesis by Mrs. Formicheva. She is also in the audience, I guess. And she has recently defended her master thesis, which you can see here. I'm going to report a little bit on outcomes from her master thesis. Um, here's the problem. We have a funnel. This is the funnel, a narrowing pipe here. So we have a narrowing pipe. There's some pressure here on top. There's some matter in here. There is gravitation. So the whole thing is pulled through the pipe. We have certain particles here, which look kind of spherical. If we go down here, the size of these particles becomes smaller and smaller. So what we see here is a crusher, a milling machine, a narrowing crusher, in order to make the whole thing more interesting. Um, the whole situation is depicted here. Um, this is a representative volume element. In, imagine these are the grains. So the grains are quite irregular. So if you homogenize this on a continuum scale, because all these grains exist in all different directions here, in all, uh, equally in all directions of space. So you get something isotropic. In the continuum scale, the moment of inertia, the micro inertia is a sphere, a spherical tensor. Now, if we put on some pressure here, if we have also some gravitational field, this will be crushed into smaller particles, still irregular, but if you homogenize them, this will be a smaller field. And what we are trying to depict here is the transition from big sphere to smaller sphere. In order to do that, we need some equations, some constitutive equations. So we are going to assume a Navier-Stokes law, an incompressible Navier-Stokes law for the, uh, for the stress tensor, which is written down here. So we have the pressure here. And uh, of course, uh, not written down here, we have the incompressibility condition, which determines the pressure. And then we have the eta here, the shear viscosity. For the shear viscosity, we link the shear viscosity to the micro inertia. The micro inertia was that field we were talking about, this balance here, micro inertia field. And um, it, it, it is spherical, as I have indicated here. So the tensor becomes a scalar, and the velocity is dependent on the size of the scalar. And um, the bigger the particles, um, the, the, the smaller the velocity, if we have very small particles, velocity goes, uh, is influenced by the uh, size of the, of the particles. So um, what we are going to do now is we are going to study this equation here, this uh, balance. This drops out because of spherical conditions, so we need to specify the, the protection term. The protection term is specified there. So it is proportional to the trace of the stress tensor, if you will, to the pressure which is acting here. And the particles can be milled down to a certain minimum size. This is a minimum size. 
which cannot be surpassed. So let's see what happens if we solve these equations. And that was done by Mrs. Formicheva. So we can also compare with a stationary solution of the cross search type for the uh, vertical uh, velocity field, which is written down here. So this is the typical parabolic profile. And we keep that in mind when we look at a numerical solution of the equations. It's a coupled situation because what you have to do, and I'm jumping back a little bit here, forgive me for doing so. So we are going to also look at the momentum balance, mass balance, and this balance here, and we solve them in parallel numerically. So this is done by introducing non-dimensional variables. And then there is a volume, um, a volume method behind the algorithm, which is indicated here. And there were some, some initial parameters with it. Um, without further ado, let me show what, what comes out of it. First of all, we are going to look at the horizontal velocity profile. Normally, if you have a, a pipe like that, there's no horizontal velocity at all. So what we see here is because of this narrowing pipe, a departure from that. And uh, these are different time steps. This initial time and time is going on. Here, almost stationary conditions have been reached. Um, this thing is actually anti-symmetric. What you see here is the absolute value of the horizontal component, the horizontal isoline. You see here in the, in the uh, narrow uh, region of the crusher, there is lots of action going on. So velocity is going to dominate here. We can also take a look at the vertical lines. If you look at this profile up here, you can check it with the analytical solution. Fits very well. If you go through the narrow, to the narrowing cross section here, things become more difficult, needs to be solved numerically. And we see huge um, uh, velocities here. These velocities are good, good for the crushing, because now we are going, we are going to, oops, that's the wrong one. Wrong one, let me say here what happened. What happened here? That one, okay, I hope it's going to show up again. Okay, there it is, too many buttons to click. Okay, I hope you can see that. Just give me a holler, can you see that? Nobody there anymore. Uh, sure, sure, we can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I, can see it. Okay. I was yes, not sure, can see it. my computer broke down for a second. So um, we were looking at these velocities here, and now let's take a look at the microinertia, the size of these particles, how it develops. So we have very small particles here, they were milled, and these areas are particularly finely milled. And this is due to the pressure which is present here, and also to the velocity profiles, which do some trick. Okay, so that was my first example, engineering example from the world of soil mechanics. Second one is more philosophical, the Gillian's B tensor. So what we are going to do now is we are going to take a look at the momentum balance, going to take a look at the spin balance, and keep in mind these definitions of the spin and the momentum. So here is the simplification we are going to do after um, Pavel Gili. So he's considering what he calls a body point, a Tchelotochka. What, what, what is that? We know mass points. Mass points have a mass. Now these body points, they have not only mass, they also carry rotational characteristics. They carry B's and J's, micro-inertia, isotropic ones for simplicity. So we are going to specialize these equations now for the isotropic case and no forces. So we're going to eliminate all the right-hand sides here, no forces at all. So this is what remains, uh, with the exception of that term on the right-hand side, this remains. And we are going to solve these differential equations. This can be done analytically, and here's the solution. The solution can be found with some typos here in this book by Gilin, and it's not very illustrative. So what does this solution tell us? There is circular motion without forces. This is what it tells us. So here's our conclusion. There can be a circular or spiral motion of a Totsky, let us say a, a charge, electric charge, without believing in the, um, in the Lorentz forces of a translationally moving charge. 
if we believe in the existence of a body point instead. Usually we don't do, do that. Here is the famous solenoid experiment between the two Helmholtz solenoids. So we have an electronic beam coming out here and the Lorentz force is forcing this beam on a curved pathway. But with this solution, we can have the same effect. And I have illustrated this here for you. So you, you, you could alternatively think in terms of a B tensor, if you believe in a Tielo-Totschka, in a body point. So that was my second example. Um, striking one, circular motion without force, quite contradicting to what Newton told us. Food for thought, I would say. So the next um, information here on micropolar materials is this one. Structural transformation during electric polarization. We are going to take a look again at this equation with a production term for the micro inertia. So, uh, okay, that was again, not right. I'm hitting the wrong button, I apologize for that. Here we go. Um, this has to do with electric polarization. What is electric polarization? I show you an example of what is known in the trade as orientational polarization. So here's an experiment. Here we have a chemical cyclohexane, a fluid pouring out here. Here we have a stick, a star, a charged, electrically charged stick. If we hold the stick next to this uh, fluid, uh, nothing happens. We do the same here with water, which has been colored for making it visible. And we have this charged stick. This is going to depart from a uh, horizontal pathway. So why is that? This is because we are inducing a, a, an orientation here of the electrical charges. Water, water mo molecules, they look, look like Mickey Mouse, essentially. So we have your Mickey and his ears. And um, there is a distribution of a negative charge here and a positive charge there. So water molecules, when they pour out here, they are randomly distributed, but they have an electric dipole. And if this thing here, the stick, which is electrically charged, is pointing at the, at the water, these will turn. So they will, they will orient. And this is called orientational polarization. So um, that is what we are going to model here. However, not for, for water molecules. We take something simplified. Uh, for our orientational polarization, we look at a simplified model. We have here rigid rods on an atomic scale. So this is a representative volume element, plus and minus. So they are also charged. Please don't ask me which chemical is like that. Um, and um, they are oriented in all directions of space. So if you homogenize this representative volume element, what you get is a J tensor, a micro, a micro inertia, which is spherical. So this is perfectly spherical. Now you switch on an electric field. And of course, these guys, they want to follow the electric field. So they want to turn towards the electric field. And you are looking at this here and you will, will see why are they not all in this direction? Because there's another force uh, acting against the thermal force. So what in the end we will get is something like that, which it is called a spheroid. So we, we get some partial orientation. And this is what we are going to model now. The orientation polarization is seen as a structural change. And this is a job for the J tensor balance of our, our micropolar media. And here is also some, some reference where this can be found. This example and much more is illustrated in a recent habilitation thesis by Jelena Wilczewskaya. And there are some, some pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, preliminary work is described here. Here we see also the, what were the, the various levels of description. Here there is the macro level. This is our continuum. And there's the continuum point. If we zoom into the continuum point, we see these elements which need to be homogenized so that we, on a continuum level, we can talk about a continuous field, in particular of the continuous J tensor. Oops, again, I'm sorry, I always hit the wrong button here. Sorry about that. I should not do that, but this is what happens. Um, the solution. So we are solving this balance. We have a production term here on the right hand side. 
we have two contributions to production. We have one production which is doing the orientation because of the electric field, which is this one. And we have one production which is against it, which is because of the thermal um, effects. And if we now solve this differential equation, which can be done analytically for this simple constant electric field, we get an equation like that. And um, let's, let's visualize this tensor equation. So this has been done here. Hopefully this is going to work. What we see here is the transition from a sphere to something which is um, not quite an ellipsoid. It is more like a papaya. It looks like a papaya. But you can see that the, the particles are trying to follow the orientation of the electrical field. So this influences the micro inertia. And that can now use, be used to determine the effect of polarization. But that's already another story which I'm not going to show. Here just some, is another outlook. This is how the, in time, the orientation is going to develop for different choices of these relaxation parameters. We have one for the electric field, we have one for the thermal, and they are competing with each other. So depending on which one is bigger, we get this type of development, this type of development, or that type of development. And if we, if we choose an alternating field, things become even more complicated. But anyway, this was just to illustrate that the equations are here, and now we have a new way of describing polarization by means of micropolar media theory. Now, the last example, which I would like to share with you, is this one, the ether as a carrier material of electromagnetic waves. This is very philosophical, a very philosophical uh, topic, and people might kill me for that. Anyway, I'm going to show it to you. Um, there it is. What are we going to achieve here? It's an old pipe dream. I, I wonder whether you know where this expression comes from. This is old pipe, the pipe dream, the English expression pipe dream is the opium pipe. So you get nice dreams when you smoke your opium. And we obviously have to do that if we try to answer the following question. Can Maxwell's equations be understood mechanically? Mechanically, are they not completely independent? We believe that, but let us see how far we can go with mechanical models. Maxwell himself, here he is, he tried that. And here we see an, a, a copy of a picture where he tries to visualize his physical lines of thought, the Faraday laws, by means of vortices and idle wheels. So this was his complicated mechanical model. He didn't know about micropolar theory, so he failed. And this is what I would like to explore in what follows. Before I do that, I have to um, get you streamlined. So I'm going to briefly, first of all, introduce you to Maxwell's equations as they are seen from the standpoint of rational electrodynamics. This is a, um, a, a phrase which is not a, a belief, which is not shared by everybody. So I'm following here Abraham Tupin or Tupin from the handbook article with Trustel or in most more recent, recent time, the book by Kovitz. Maxwell's equations, according to this law, are two independent sets. The first set has to do with the force field E and the force field B with the electric and magnetic field. These laws are also known as Faraday's laws and the law of non-existing magnetic monopoles, and they are written down here. And then we have a second set of Maxwell's equations, which is completely, first of all, independent of this red set. It has to do with the conservation of charge, or also known as the continuity equation for charge, which is formally expressed like this. This is charge density. This is um, electric current. This is uh, the, the flux of, uh, of charge, the, uh, the, the one which we can see with a material velocity. This is the flux we cannot see. And in order to solve this equation, in this equation, two new fields are introduced, the D field and the H field, which is in this rational electrodynamics, also known as the charge and the current potential. And if we solve that, then we get the oersted ampere law, which is written down here, and the Gauss law. So in total, we have E and B and D and H, four fields. How are these four fields related? 
And the answer in rational theory of electromagnetism is, well, they are related by the so-called maxwell lorentz ether relations. These are valid only in a simple form in an inertial frame, in a Lorentz frame. And they are, they are simply proportional. And we have two constants of proportionality, which I'm sure you know all of them, these permittivities, uh, electrical and magnetic permittivities. Now, if we take this, and if we take that, and if we take the red set, what we get is wave equations. Wave equations for the vacuum. If we have no charges, no electric currents, neither free ones nor generated ones, then we get these nice electric, these nice wave equations for the electric and magnetic fields. Traditionally, we say there is no need for a medium to carry these waves. But from the very beginning on, there were attempts to interpret the ether as a material and to derive Maxwell's equations from the equations of continuum mechanics. And these derivations, they suffered from internal contradictions, especially when a change of observer was performed. And they were both based on classical non-micropolar continuum theory. And recently, Gillen and his group and successors, they tried to use micropolar theory to clarify the mechanical approach. Let me share this with you. Actually, as I said before Gilin, there were also attempts to derive uh, Maxwell's equations. And here's Sommerfeld's. This is Sommerfeld's. Sommerfeld's equation derivation from his textbook, volume two on theoretical physics. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, again. Okay, was I not hearable for a time? Uh, for a few seconds. For a few seconds, I'm sorry. So actually, uh, we are running a bit late, so I have uh, something like uh, uh, five minutes. Yes, so I, I will be finished in five minutes. So basically what you do is you look at the linear momentum and you assume an expression for the stress tensor you get this equation for linear momentum. You uh, recall the vorticity equation, incompressibility. You make some identifications and these equations turn into Maxwell's equations. Sommerfeld says, now Sommerfeld says, well, this is at most not a mechanical explanation, but a mechanical analogy. More recently, we have Gillen's derivation alternatively where he looks at the spin balance, makes some assumptions regarding the micropolar material, and goes through the algebra and arrives Erster's Ampere's law and Gauss law by assuming something about the, um, the um, uh, spin and about the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, coupled stress tensor. This coupled stress tensor is uh, the carrier, one of the carrier of the electromagnetic fields. And if you now look at the internal energy balance, you can also get to the other two equations of Maxwell's with an interesting expression of the speed of light. So um, that's what I wanted to show to you. So we reviewed briefly modern continuum theories with a rotational degree of freedom. And we saw some applications of micropolar micro theory in and outside of continuum mechanics. We tried to answer the question, can electromagnetism be mechanically motivated or is electricity mechanical? Um, Gillian did much more. He also looked into quantum phenomena. Can they be interpreted in terms of internal variables? And at the end, I would like to share this picture with you, which show Wolfgang Pauli and Niels Bohr and they are watching a spin and this shows how important rotational degrees of freedoms are. Thank you very much for the attention. Dear colleagues, we have uh, a really short time for a few questions. Uh, if possible, I would like to ask a question, uh, Anton Kristof. Um, Professor Muller, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture and very um, wide, uh, wide uh, area of material you have um, used for that. 
And um, actually, uh, regarding the last part, uh, which is extremely interesting, I think, even nowadays, uh, this uh, mechanical analogy for electromagnetic fields and uh, at the uh, description of the processes in the micro world, uh, what, do you, what do you think? So probably uh, maybe more uh, complex micropolar theories could be used uh, to describe the phenomena which we are uh need to describe nowadays in the um, uh, micro world um i think it is definitely an area which is worthwhile pursuing because i think it is always good to have analogies maybe it is more than an analogy if it is more than an analogy that would be even better but even if it is just an analogy it can prompt us and help us to model electromagnetic phenomena phenomenologically in a better way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, maybe my question. I'm sorry, excuse me. Can I ask? Yes, Professor, I you. how are you? I, 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 I'm very glad to hear and to see you. Much well you can thanks speak on the, the for your camera. I hear you, Professor. Wait, you Please camera. continue. Dear, dear Professor, thank you very much for your interesting report. And it was a very glad, I am very glad to hear about our teacher, Professor Zhilin. It was a very pleasure for me. My question will be so. The success oh, I lost. Theory, the successful of the theory is depending on the terms which you write about the source of the uh, terms which describes of your balance equation, equations. What the term we shall think our idea, the result will be another. What do you think? Have you any uh, model of my source? Well, we try to approach the question on how the source term can look like from a rational mechanics point of view. You have representation theories. If you agree on the variables this term is supposedly to depend upon, then you can take the full machinery of rational mechanics and write down a general expression of the source term. And then you have to discuss for a particular situation, which of the various contributions are important and which ones can be neglected. This would be my answer. I think it is a big, the source terms provide a great possibility in modeling materials. But what, let's take your full equation. Show please again your full equation for balance. What, let's, let's see. Let's see, for example, Can you, you see, see uh, the, uh, the, uh, yes, yes, yes. But let's see for this equation. For example, balance of tensor balances. You see in the part, uh, uh, the right part of my equation, the sources which describes another, another, another source of my particles, another, what, what might be changed. Can you say about this? Where, the, yes, here, here, you're right, you're right. Where I can take them? I can, it's sometimes I have an idea. The, the point is, as I said, for the, you have to, to first agree. How to find them. But in common situation, you have to agree on the set of variables the process is dependent upon. Then you know what kind, this is a tensor function. And then you can say, okay, this is, for instance, an isotropic tensor function. And how can we express the isotropic tensor function in terms of all the variables it may depend upon? 
And if it is not anisotropic, then you have to specify the degree of anisotropy and write down the full machine. And then you get many terms and then you have to discuss which of these terms will be important for your particular material. The answer will be different in every case. There needs to be also some physical insight which of the terms is important. And I think this insight can come from microscopic atomistic considerations. I see. Thank you. It was good seeing Thank you. Thank you, Professor dear Professor. Professor. Dear Paul Bang, my best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. We have one more question. Victor, please. Okay. Dear yeah, Wolfgang, nice to, see, to hear you in the same place, the same time, almost the same time. I would like you to ask in your motivation to macropolar theory. I am wondering why you should not, why not mention such effects of magnetic field? Oh. Because in fluids, for example, there are so-called magnetic fluids and they magnetic field produce moment and volumetric volumes, uh, volumetric moments, sorry, and these people must introduce something real resistance to rotations. And so they introduce some kind of so-called anisotropic fluids, etc., etc. So it's just example of, let's say, typical supported macropolar applications for magnetic fluids. So the question is, why did I not mention it? Yes, there because are many it's... answers, my dear friend, are possible. First of all, because I do not have enough time. This is one answer. Second, because we just started to work on electric fields and tried to solve the boundary value problems, initial boundary value problems. Third, I fully agree with you, it should be incorporated and uh, it is important in particular for, for, for liquid crystal di displays. There you will have always a combination of electric and magnetic fields which are turning these crystals and of course this is all hidden here in this set of equations. I'm not against it, I just cannot do everything at the same time. Okay, I'm sent you, but let me say that this magnetic without micropolar properties, no one can describe magnetic fields. My dear okay. friend, thank you very much for the information. I'm all for it, and I'm sure that in our collaboration, we have many things to investigate. So there is yes, lots true. of Let's hope. interesting things to discover. Yeah, thank you.